Good evening guys and girls, welcome to lesson number 36 in our drawing series, uh, drawing techniques for beginners. We're really starting to get towards the end of this Converse trainer now uh, and I think we've probably got maybe one or two sessions left and we will be uh, at a position that we could call this a day. So without further ado, uh, just make sure that you've freshened up your kneaded eraser. I like to do that before every session. I've quickly sharpened a couple of my pencils. I think I'm going to be focusing today uh, on the 6B uh, and the 2B pencil. We're going to be focusing and, and mainly working around the bottom shadow, the cast shadow, and I want to try and get a few of these details in the shoelaces as well. So let's get started. I'm going to actually turn this reference image around now slightly making sure that it's still in frame for you. And uh, I like to do this because I want to make sure that I'm using my tapered stroke in its most accurate and efficient way. Uh, and I like to use my tapered stroke in a pulling, pulling direction towards me. Now, for those of you that uh, aren't too sure about the tapered stroke, or this might be the first time that you've visited my channel or you've recently joined our Facebook group uh, which is called Tutorial Tuesdays Beginner to Pro. If you haven't already joined that uh, go and find that over on Facebook and hit that request button and I will accept your request. Uh, but if this is sort of one of the first times or you've, you're quite new to this, um, I am I'm trying to teach you a method or a series of methods that I've picked up over the last three, three and a half years. And um, the best method for me uh, is one which uses something called a tapered stroke. So what I'm actually doing here is I'm laying down thousands and thousands of lines. Now in this video, it may look as though what I'm actually doing is scribbling. So the, a forwards and backwards action. But actually um, what I'm really doing is just making the pencil strokes in one direction. So I'm, I'm pulling that pencil towards me. Now this does a couple of things really. Um, it, it builds up a value over a period of time. So I'm not going straight in with a 2B pencil or a 4B pencil uh, or even a 6B, let's say, in this shadowed area and pressing down too hard. Um, I'm building the value up. Now this gives me the first opportunity it gives me is it gives me complete control. So what I'm actually able to do is I'm actually able to build the values up and get to a stage in the drawing where I'm happy with it and I could leave it well alone. The second thing that it does is it doesn't damage the tooth of the paper. Now for those of you that have been drawing for any amount of time you'll understand that every sheet of paper has something called a tooth to it. It isn't completely flat and you really don't want to be looking for a paper that is too smooth and too flat. Uh, I've seen people trying to do drawings on this shiny type of card. Um, I don't know what you would call that, but uh, when you're working with graphite, the tooth of the paper is really something that we can work with. Um, and it's something that we certainly want to try to preserve as best as we can. So this tapered stroke allows me to build the values up without the need for damaging like we've, we've spoken about the tooth of the paper. So the tapered stroke is like we've said a series of lines and I'm building the, the value up gradually. I'm starting with this 2B pencil uh, and I'm going to work through to the 6B, uh, maybe going through the 4B as well. Um, I also like to make sure that as I'm doing this tapered stroke every now and then I'm just turning the pencil. I'm holding the pencil about halfway up uh, I see a lot of artists and they're bearing down on the on the pencil uh, and what this does is it really makes you almost dig in and and uh, and gouge the tooth of the paper and again if you think about what we've just been speaking about being able to preserve the tooth of the paper is so important and the reason we want to preserve the tooth of the paper uh, is because one of the most important uh, aspects of any drawing is being able to remove value so in some of the lighter areas, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be using uh, our erasers and we're going to be removing the value. 
um, if you actually have a look at some of this. I mean, it's one of the reasons why I picked this picture of the Converse trainer because we've got such fantastic contrast in here. We've got the darks of the canvas and then we've got this startling white of the, of the sole of the trainer. But in and amongst that, we've got these different grays. We've got these different um, tones in here and a, a realistic drawing which is something that I'm trying to achieve with this it's um it's not the only it's, it's not the only type of drawing you know I've got a lot of time for cartoon work and um you know I've had a go at a lot of cartoon work myself uh, but I learned to draw realistically and I, I feel that once you've mastered or you're on the way to mastering realism in your artwork with with just pencils you can then turn your hand to um to any medium uh, and any art style, the foundations and the fundamentals that you've you've learned will, will stay with you. So being able to remove graphite in the lightest areas and just have a range of values is something that I think is absolutely paramount if you want to be uh, if you want to be good at drawing realistically, but then understanding these values also gives you a better understanding of other mediums. So if you then want to turn your hand to working with pastels or colored pencils or uh, ink work, just understanding that certain things are lighter than others, but we can make something look lighter by the surrounding values around it. Um, we know that this shoelace is a white color because we understand and we interpret this because the areas around it are darker. This is actually quite a dark color, but our brain is interpreting this as being lighter than this, hence it being white, the same as this shadowed area on the sole of the trainer. And uh, that's a very, very important lesson to learn and try and produce within your, your drawings. So again, I'm just gonna move this paper. Now, um, I really would say to you, if, when you are doing your drawings, move your paper as much as possible. I know I've been commenting uh, recently over the last week on quite a few of your um, drawings. There's been quite a few new members that are starting with some of the first lessons. So we're talking about lessons one through six. And if you haven't discovered the playlist yet with the entire series of lessons, we're on sort of lesson 36 now. Um, I would suggest going to the YouTube channel, which is Artistic N1K, and having a look under the playlist uh, section at the top of the at the top of the channel, and in there is Tutorial Tuesdays Beginner to Pro. Alternatively, you can join our Facebook group, uh, which is called Tutorial Tuesdays Beginner to Pro, and I do post every video when it uh, when it releases, and also you will be able to find the playlist up there. But uh, I've seen a few people that have been recently joining the groups, and they've been having a go at the spheres and the barrels, and one of the recurring themes, and it's one of the recurring messages that I find myself replying, uh, is make sure you keep turning the paper because at the moment my stroke is coming in this direction, it's sort of coming diagonally down uh, if we were looking at this in landscape. Uh, but in order to try and keep my value changes smooth, I might want to change my direction. So instead of trying to get my hand and contorting my hand into some weird and wonderful direction, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to move the paper. And that's going to help me build up a, a value where the, um, where the pencil strokes are sort of overlapping. If you imagine these are my pencil strokes and then I'm going to build a, a series of pencil strokes going in this direction and then some in this direction and some in this direction. What you then have is you have a very smooth and very, very um, thorough and saturated sort of value in the paper. Every stroke that I use, whether I'm using a HB pencil, 2H pencil, whatever I'm using, um, I'm trying to, to use the same pressure. So I'm not bearing down too hard initially. I'm just getting this first layer of value. And you'll also notice that I don't use anything to blend with. So I don't use a blending stump or a tortillion. I don't use tissue papers or Q-tips. I have been down that route. My, um, my art journey or my drawing journey absolutely incorporated all of those techniques. Um, this is the technique that I find works the best for me. And like I say, it's not the only technique, but uh, I want you to 
to hopefully pick up some of my best practices and and then you can maybe add a few of your own ingredients on top of that which is a which is the fantastic thing about art uh, i guess it's a little bit like cooking you know you stick to the basic recipe but you can add your own different elements to that so i'm quite happy now that i've got a decent decent coverage with this 2b pencil um, one thing that i really want you to pay attention to is this part of our shadow is the darkest it's getting lighter as it comes away from the trainer itself and we want to incorporate that in our drawing so i'm going to make sure that i do fill out a little bit more of the value directly underneath and what this also does is it it, it gives our trainer um the the look that it's sitting on something rather than floating it connects the floor or the shelf or whatever this train is sitting on it connects it to the object now, i've seen some fantastic drawings where people have not quite grasped this element and their wonderful drawing ends up looking like it's floating in midair and um, it just takes away from all the hard work that they've done so just try and make sure that we are understanding always and paying attention to how light works and how it affects shadows and how it affects um, objects in and around a shadow. Everything that goes towards the darker parts of your drawing is going to be getting darker. Hence the, the shoelace here. We've got a very white area of shoelace here, but it gets darker as it goes away from the light. The light source is coming from this area, this, this top left angle. So I'm just going to try and represent that as many times as I can throughout my drawing. And if I manage to do that, what I end up with is something that's quite believable. Okay, I'm going to come in with the 4B now, actually. I'm not going to jump straight up to the 6B, uh, which is always, it's always something that is very tempting. Um, and the reason I'm not going to jump up there is because... I can just see, and you possibly might not be able to see this on the on the video because it's something that you, you I'm only noticing close up. Um, just with that 2B coverage, I'm starting to see a few of those white pitted areas in the tooth of the paper starting to emerge. So I want to try and fill those in. And the reason I've not filled those in is because I've gone in with a quite a soft pencil start to start with, which is the 2B pencil. Now, if I'm not careful, I'm going to end up with something that looks quite grainy and certainly within this shadowed area because we haven't got a texture there I can get away with it in this area because we have got a material texture um, but this is this trainer is sitting on something that's rather flat by the look of it and I don't want I don't want to stray too far away from the reference image if I can help it I'm trying to train you and teach you how to see things and copy them identically and once you've you've mastered that art of seeing what's really there rather than allowing your brain to interpret things differently you can then go on to any type of art that you like now one thing that we always want and I, and I would say to you go and have a look in real life at some shadows and you will always have a slightly fuzzy edge so this edge here isn't going to be a very harsh end to the shadow and that's simply because of how the light works we haven't got a solid solid object here it's the solid object is here and the light is casting uh, the shadow and but just go and have a look in real life you know when you've got a, a fantastically sunny day out there go and have a look at some of the shadows around you have a look at the shadows that the buildings are casting and hold your hand out and look very closely at the edge of the shadow and it will always in every single instance it will be slightly fuzzy around the edge so i'm getting a much nicer um saturation of value now so without jumping straight up to the 6b there i can now come in with my 6b and 
not be too concerned that I'm going to have this grainy look. And you'll notice every time I start, I'm always coming into the area that's going to be the darkest. And that's this edge where the train is actually sitting on the surface. I'm highlighting that and I'm fading out. Now because I'm building this value up incrementally, I can always take it away. If I feel I've gone too dark, and I haven't gone too dark with this because we have got quite a harsh shadow there, um, but let's say that I had gone too dark, I can easily take the value away using my kneaded eraser. Okay. It's always good to have a look at your um, your drawing from different angles as well. So I really would recommend turning your drawing around and having a look at it in a, a different angle. Turn it upside down because when you've sat for a prolonged period of time looking at a reference image and looking at your drawing, your brain starts to switch off and you almost become snow blind um, with the, the harsh white. So I think it's important that we do give our eyes and our brain a, a different perspective and a different look at things. And what that will do is it will just highlight some of the areas that you maybe need to work on. Okay, quite happy with that now. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start now looking at a little bit of the detail in this shoelace itself. Now, I can see in there that we've got, we've, whoops, and lost the 2B. I want the HB pencil. So I'm going to start working with this HB pencil. Um, we've got a we've got a, a pattern in here. Um, these shoelaces are made out of almost like a woven thread. Uh, and, and I just want to just start to build that in a little bit. So we've almost got a zigzag type pattern uh, in there. And we can see it better in the shaded area than we can in the in the light area. So let me just roughly feel where this cast shadow comes and then I'm going to work within that area and it's these small details these very subtle details that you would imagine aren't going to make a huge difference and why would I spend 10 minutes on something that we're not really going to see, particularly from a distance, but it's one of those things that your brain interprets things that you wouldn't believe it possible. And it's what gives our drawings that look, and it's what makes them stand out. It only needs to be a, an indication. I don't need to get bogged down with the details. I'm, I'm just picking out some of the general directions that some of these woven fibers are going in. I'm just pushing the viewer's brain into a direction that I want them to go into a into a place that is suggesting that there's something there and I'm gonna let their brain make the rest up. It's a little bit like looking at the clouds and interpreting things, faces, animals. They aren't really there, but it's amazing what our mind can conjure up. So again, I'm now gonna start adding a little bit of value. And the beauty is because I've now got that texture in there, a little bit like one of the earlier videos when we started working in this area. We built the texture up initially, and now I add the value, I bring the value up around the texture, but I also bring the value up within the texture as well. So those lines are going to remain darker. I might need to do a, a little bit of adjustment later on, but 
I can always see where they are, where those zigzaggy type patterns are. Now, I definitely need to come into my 2B now. So I really want to highlight this darker area under underneath here because we've got one shoelace that's sitting on top of another. And actually, as we're looking at our drawing here, this, this small area here is one of our darkest parts. So I need to take that opportunity and grasp it with both hands and really try and highlight that area or maybe highlights the wrong word because I don't want it to be light, I want it to be dark. I want this to be an area, a dark area that catches my viewer's eye. So I need some 4B in there for sure. Now it would have been easy for me initially to just jump in there with the 4B, but again, I'm trying to balance these values and I don't want to damage the tooth of the paper because I will be taking some value out in there uh, because some of those crisscrossed zigzaggy patterns are actually light. So I'm going to be able to remove those because I haven't damaged the tooth of the paper. I'm going to just brush the, the value in a little bit now using my soft, very soft brush. A makeup brush will do. And now I'm taking my Mono Zero eraser and I'm just going to bring out some of those zigzaggy patterns within the shadow. On both shoelaces. And again, I'm not getting bogged down with the detail. I'm not making sure every single piece of material or piece of the shoelace is in there, but I'm giving a, a general indication as to how things are, the direction that they're moving in, an indication of texture. And I can even, again, using my kneaded eraser, I'm just gonna bring this to a small point, can even start to just take a little bit of the value out if I need to. And this is something I would really encourage you doing. Um, the removal of value before then applying a little bit more. So I can see now, I'm nowhere near dark enough in this shadowed area. So I'm just applying a light coverage of 2B. And because I've taken out some of the value with the Mono Zero Eraser, I'm getting highlighted areas within this value range. So although they are still fairly dark, the areas that I've taken value out are remaining slightly one step lighter than the surrounding areas. Now I think what I'm going to do, because we've got such a highlight in this shoelace, that I'm going to take some of this value back up to there and see where that leaves us now. Because what we might find is the shadowed area of the shoelace might be dark enough I might be happy with it once I remove the value in and around. There we go. So that's exactly highlighted what I've just been talking about. With the removal of some of the excess value in this area, it's now brought the value of that shoelace or that shadow up by quite a long way. So. I can sort of see now where I I need to add a little bit more value and I maybe only need to just add some more of those finer details, some of those zigzags with the 2B pencil and that might just bring the value 
of that shadow up enough that I would be happy with that. Now remembering as we go up into this darkest area of the shoelace, these details need to be slightly darker than they do down here. Everything that goes away from the, dark, uh, from the light source gets darker. Everything that comes towards the light source gets lighter, even in a darkened area or even in a lighter area. So although these shoelaces are the same color, if we were looking at this under one, one light source, these are all the same color, um, but they're not all the same color because the shadow's casting. Now I can see a little bit of detail in this area here. So I've actually taken my 2H pencil now because they are fairly light details. We've got such a bright light source shining on them that I've only got a hint. And we've got a slight overlap on this area here. Okay. Looking quite nice. I'm just, again, I'm just reinforcing this darkest overlap because it's something that's drawing my eye in and if it's drawing my eye in even though I have a slightly trained eye and I do look for these things if it's if my eye is picking this up then that means that somebody looking at my artwork will also or it's certainly something that I want to lead them into looking at So it's been really fantastic yet again. I know I say this every video, but the group's brilliant. I mean, I've been looking at a lot of other art groups this week and there's controversy and arguing and people putting spam messages up there and things that have nothing to do with art groups. Um, and I'm happy to say that there's very, very few posts that I'm finding that I'm having to remove. Uh, there's been a couple and uh, I just remove the post and get rid of the user. It's not what we're about. We're not... We're not there for spam. There's plenty of art groups out there. If you want to be spamming dating websites and asking for WhatsApp groups, then, you know, go ahead, you know, crack on with that. That's absolutely your priority and your prerogative. But uh, I'm happy to say that the group's staying pretty much as it always has been, which is very encouraging. Lots of people giving, you know, their art a, a, a new lease of life or starting it for the first time. And... Um, Everybody so far is acting rather grown up on there, which is unbelievable for Facebook. I know for sure I've uh, been tearing my hair out at times with some of the groups and the behaviour on there. So thank you so much for making it a wonderful group. I do appreciate it. And uh, some of the messages that you leave me are, are, are fantastic. And, you know, I'm I'm doing this because I love drawing. Um, drawing and arts, you know, changed my outlook on life. I've uh, discovered a side of me that I didn't realise was there. I was always interested in drawing, but uh, I never realised how much and how big a, an impact it would have. So I just really want to try and give that opportunity to as many people as I can. And like I've said in the past, I've spent hundreds of pounds on art lessons and products and things like that. And there's a few pitfalls that we can avoid. And if I can help you avoid them without spending loads of money, then that's another great thing. Because although art is a, it's quite an expensive pursuit, I would guess, um, there are far more expensive things that we can be doing out there with our money. Um, golf, skiing, those types of activities tend to be rather expensive. But, you know, if I can help you out at all with a minimal cost to you, then that's, uh, that's, that's my wish. So I'm, I'm still just paying attention to these zigzaggy type material. I guess they're thin strands of string, aren't they, that are woven together in a certain pattern. I tell you what it almost looks like. It almost looks like the tire tread on cars. I've, I've done a few cars. I've done a, a couple of transformer cars, which, um, which were cool. A year or so back, and um, 
This does remind me of looking at the, some of the tire treading in some of those cars. Uh, but just getting a general feel for them and the general direction that things are moving in. So I'm going to have to, I'm definitely going to have to keep really reinforcing this startling white of this area of, of shoelace. So I'm using my Mono Zero razor now. And you can just see how much graphite builds up over the drawing that you wouldn't imagine was there, but is. And I would guess that once I've, once I've done this, this is going to be an area that I will revisit towards the end of the drawing once I've got some of the shadows and the rest of it in place. Um, what I'm going to do is I can see that we're sort of at about 30 minutes. Um, what I wanted to, to do before I finish today's session is I want to just get some value in uh, to this area here, the front of the shoe, because it's going to give me a better indication of how much value I need to bring into these shoelaces here. So I always like to work in the dark areas first. I know that there's a few techniques and there's a few artists out there, certainly on YouTube and, you know, around the internet that, that, that do work from light to dark. Um, my reasons for working from dark to light are if I, if I bring the values up in the light areas too much, and that's where I'm starting, what then happens is I have to bring the values in the darkest areas up even more than I maybe want to do, um, which is more time consuming. Uh, it doesn't make for a better picture. Uh, what, what we want to do is we want balanced values. And I don't necessarily need to copy the exact values that I've got on my reference image. Some people do that and they get, you know, what we would almost call a photorealistic look, but I don't need to necessarily do that. Sometimes I might want to do that. But I can guarantee you that this is nowhere near as dark as this. If we had a value finder, and um, they're easy enough to get hold of, you can get value finders and print them off of, off of the internet for free. You don't need to spend money on them. Uh, if you've got a value finder, which is a, I've got a piece of cardboard that I actually purchased it. It was a couple of pounds from Amazon. And um, it's just got various different values on there different greys ranging from black all the way to white and basically what you would do is you would match up the closest value on your reference in a, in a, a certain area on your reference and um, you would then have a look at it and put it on your drawing and so I'd find one that matched this and then I'd put it here and I don't think I've ever done a drawing where I've got the value the same my drawing's always been lighter um, but working from the dark to the light it allows me to stop and finish, even though I maybe haven't gone as dark in some of the other areas, as long as I've balanced the values. So as long as my white areas are always the whitest and my dark areas are always the darkest, it gives me that opportunity to finish and leave it. So I'm still layering this 2B pencil and I'm paying attention to where the darkest area is. This area here is the darkest area. It's the furthest away from the light. This area is lighter than this. So I'm going to try and recreate that with every grade of pencil that I've got. And you can see I've left this. So I've left that initially. I'm working in this area. I'm building more value up, more layers of graphite. And then that's going to remain lighter as I come out to it. Now you can ease the pressure off. One of the biggest skills that you're going to learn is this pressure with the pencil. I am really feathering this on now. I mean, I'm, I'm barely touching the paper because I want to represent this part of the trainer. It's what's going to give it dimension. It's going to trick the brain into believing that what it's looking at is curved. The light is hitting this area because it's a curved surface and it's closer to the light source than this. We've also got the shoe behind, which is obscuring it as well. But I, I need to create that. I need to have that in my drawing.
okay. Now I can also see that we have this dark line continues round here. So we have this clean edge continues round um, and it's not as evident that it's a band of black. I guess it's black rubber uh, because we've got so much shadowing under there, but I can see it. And I would one one tip I would always say to you is get yourself a a picture or the reference in as high a quality and higher resolution as you can. Uh, and I always display my reference image on an iPad in front of me as well as printing it out because the detail, uh, the the definition that you can get on a tablet or a phone is much better than. You, I mean, I guess you can get printers out there that have got you know some serious resolution on them but i guess they're the kind of things that you're getting in offices and whatnot that are costing thousands of pounds but um i can see more detail uh, than i can get printed out so if you've got the opportunity to have your reference image displayed not only on the paper but on something in front of you as well a tablet or a laptop or something uh, i really would suggest that. Uh, the other thing is try and make sure that your reference images, like we said, are of really good quality. I've recently been asked to do a commission for somebody and it's of a relative that recently passed and um, this person sent me some reference images that were very, very poor quality. Um, and I think sometimes I say to people and it almost sounds rude, but um, I say to them, you know, this image that you've sent me, would you be happy to put this up on a frame or in a frame on the wall of your house or wherever you want this drawing displayed? Quite often they say no. So my next question is, why are you asking me to draw this then? And I think sometimes what people think is you're going to magically produce something that isn't there. And although there are artists out there that can do that, I don't like to do it because I like to draw what's really there. So I'm not going to add hair or add dimples to a face or something that isn't there. So don't feel if you're, you know, if you get to the stage where you're being asked to do a commission for somebody, don't feel obliged to try and do a drawing from a poor quality image. Ask for lots of different angles, ask for different looks. Um, of the reference because what you might see in one reference image might be it may not be there in another one so the way the light's hitting somebody's face may may produce what looks like a dimple or a pimple but the reality of it is it might not be there that might just be that one reference image so it's really important that you get these things right because there's nothing worse than handing over a, a drawing that you've spent hours producing and you've got a dimple in the wrong place or something that's there in one reference image that they're giving you but then they go oh well it, that isn't how this person looks i'm going to come in with the 4b now you can probably see by the shortness of this pencil that it's a uh, it's the 4b it's it's one of my most used pencils by the look of it i wouldn't have known that if you'd have asked me without looking at my pencils but quite clearly it is. So I'm quite happy with that now. So I've got this darker edge going away from the light, coming into the lighted area there. Okay. So um, what I'm going to do in between now and next lesson is I'm just going to start picking out some of these darker shadows underneath some of these shoelaces. I'm going to continue developing the details in the shoelaces. I'm going to work a little bit more on the front of this trainer here and possibly bringing out a little bit of the darkness underneath in this shadow, which will then set us up nicely for the end of next lesson, towards the end of, well, during next lesson, we will get the, the base of this trainer done. And then I think we'll almost be there. We'll just go through a few balancing values, uh, but I'm quite happy with the progress we've made today. I know we're on 40 minutes. I can see by the time in front of me that we're on 40 minutes. Uh, and I do like to keep these videos out about 30 minutes, but I think it's been worth it because 
I'm quite happy with the progress we've made and I'm pretty sure we're about one sitting away from it. So thank you so much once again for sitting and listening uh, to me go on uh, for 40 minutes. Uh, But what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to give you an indication of what's going through my head as I'm drawing. So it may sometimes sound like I'm rambling, but they're the... uh, They're the ramblings of a madman, somebody might say. I'm just trying to give you an insight as to how I'm doing things, why I'm doing things, and um, I'm trying to articulate them as best as I can. But uh, thank you so much for being so supportive in the group. Come and find us if you haven't already done so. Uh, Don't forget to give the video a thumbs up and share and subscribe to the channel. Uh, I really do appreciate the support, and it does really help uh, get this channel out there and people um, sort of from around the world having a a fab time drawing and getting to know some of you guys in the group. Uh, Thanks so much for watching and I will leave you at that. And I must stop drawing. Um, And I'll see you guys over in the group and I'll see you in the next video. Thanks so much for watching. Hit subscribe, smack the notifications button, follow me on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter.